All right, good afternoon. This is Frank McNally from Public Spend Forum. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for our webinar, Missed Connections, where we're going to do a little real talk on government contracting. Uh, this is presented by Public Spend Forum, the Pulse of Government Contracting and Lunar Line Incorporated. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Um, we will be uh, taking questions from the audience today because we want this to be a very constructive dialogue. We want you to have a chance to ask questions. So there's two ways to do that. You can use the chat feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you sort of hover your mouse at the bottom of the Zoom player, it should bring up a toolbar where you can ask a question in the chat or you can submit as a Q&A. Um, our colleague, Yanisa Perez de Leon, is going to be moderating, moderating that chat and can feed questions to us as they come. Um, and uh, wanted to tell you real quickly a little bit about public spend form and what we do. So we are a market intelligence platform for public sector buyers and suppliers. We offer supplier and market knowledge and data, best practice frameworks and tools, how to's, this webinar that you're attending, other things like that. And um, also importantly, a global community and network of peers and experts in public procurement. You can register uh, publicspendform.net and get involved in that conversation and take advantage of some of the great resources we have. And that is free registration. We've also created within Public Spend Forum uh, a market research tool called GovShop. It's a single place to search, find, and connect with suppliers. It's easy to use and free. There's no, uh, there's no licenses to buy. There's nothing to download. You can literally go to GovShop.com and start searching right now. We've built it for the GovCon community. It's got filters like socioeconomic status, small business size, ownership, things that are very relevant for folks that are doing market research out there. And if you're a supplier, come create your own profile. Uh, you, you can create that for free, uh, put information in there like keywords about what you do, the contract vehicles that you own, product service codes that you qualify under so that when our buyer community, our government contracting professionals are doing market research within GovShop, they can find your company. All right, that's enough about that. Uh, I want to welcome um, three guests today that we have who are going to be leading the conversation. Uh, we're very pleased to have Amber Hart and Lisa Shea Munt from the uh, Pulse of Government uh, Contracting and Spence Witten from Lunar Line. So uh, Amber and Lisa, why don't you guys introduce yourselves first and then we'll, um, we'll have Spence do it real quick and then we can get into the discussion today. Sure. Uh, this is Amber. I'll go first. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Amber Hart, and I am one of the co-founders and co-owners of the Pulse of GovCon, where we're a boutique market intelligence firm providing information and analysis in the GovCon space. Yep, that's great. My name is Lisa Shea Munt. I am the other co-founder and owner of the Pulse of GovCon. Exactly what Amber said, uh, we focus a lot on contract and opportunity identification for government contractors. My name is Spence Witten. I am the Vice President of Global Sales at LunarLine. LunarLine is a, uh, about half government, half private sector cybersecurity firm. Um, you know, I've, most of my career has been spent in government contracting. I had some, some pretty strong opinions about what works, what doesn't. And I value honest conversation and honest dialogue um, uh, about you know, those issues between government and industry. And, then, and now, uh, you know, in my, my current role, I also touch a lot on the private sector. So I see best practices from both sides. And I like to, you know, talk about those when I get the opportunity. And we've we've appreciated Spence's input uh, to date. Um, some a long time sort of fans of Public Spend Forum probably have read a few of Spence's articles on publicspendforum.net. We've recently gotten to know Amber and Lisa and really love what they're doing at the Pulse of GovCon. Um, my name is Frank McNally. I'm the director of learning and content development here at Public Spend Forum. I'm going to be moderating the conversation today uh, and hopefully doing a good job of that. Um, by letting Amber, Lisa, and Spence share their perspectives with you. Uh, they all have private sector experience. They've all been on the other side of the proposals and the things that we do within government contracting. I uh, have been on the, the government side and the private side, but I might represent a little bit more of the 1102, the contracting professional voice today. Um, but basically what we want to do is talk about three sort of key areas that we think they're uh, sort of exists the most sort of gap, the most lack of understanding between both sides. And those three topics are key personnel, market research, and best-in-class contracts. So we're going to start with key personnel. And, uh, and what I want to kick off with is really what key personnel kind of means. I mean, so we've all 
we've all seen the proposals, we've all seen the management approach sections or the request for the staffing plan. Uh, my first question for our panel is, do companies really follow these approaches? Um, and, and if so, how do they do it? So I'm gonna toss that out there. Whoever wants to take it first, uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. So uh, this is Amber, I'll jump in first and um, I'll kind of say what I think we're all, we all kind of know, right? Especially coming from the proposal war room world is that if this was family feud, the number one uh, item for GovCom proposal, proposal boilerplate would be the management and staffing volume, hands down. Um, you know, it's an unfortunate reality. Uh, so do companies follow it? I Maybe to a point, but a lot of what is written in these proposals, I can promise you, has been written 10 times over. And as old as it gets, the less it becomes reviewed. Um, that's just in my opinion uh, with I what we write in proposals. I completely agree with that. Uh, so Amber and I, we have a very strong proposal background, about 10 years being proposal managers and writers. And we've also been proposal consultants for the last four to five of those years. And as consultants, we get to work with a lot of different companies, the mom and pop shops and the big integrators. And I can tell you that all of your staffing sections look the same, <laughs> having not just worked for one government contractor. My, you know, it's got these kind of cliches like source, attract, recruit, onboard, and retain. I, I mean, if I had a nickel for every company that told me that they had a deep bench, what does that even mean? How deep is your bench? For every staffing graphic. <laughs> I mean, what it comes down to and what we've seen is that even at some of these large companies, if there's, you know, a proposal that's calling for 60 personnel and, and 60 resumes, I've worked at multi you know billion dollar companies that haven't even been able to reach into that deep bench to get me 60 resumes I, so i don't know if these exist if these benches really exist is the bench just indeed.com you know discuss <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in with that with with uh with lisa too you know she said 60 resumes i mean i recently was working with a large uh defense integrator systems integrator that couldn't even get five uh, you know, key personnel sneeze, and it's really hard out there to hire, but also then the timeline, right, between these key selections and these submittals, and then between that and the protests and the Q&A and the EN, and then the award. I mean, even if you're lucky enough to fill these uh, key personnel resumes, right, with the right people, um, you know, it's kind of like the longer you go down the line, you might be lucky to keep one, right, Since I mean, does that, what ha happens to you typically on proposals, not to call you out, but how many do you yeah. end up with? Oh, I mean, it's, it's it kind of, it kind of varies between specific ops, but it's definitely not as, uh, as many as anybody would like. I think one of the things that really frustrates, you know, both sides of this, this question is, um, A, I, you know, I think, one thing I really try to hype on when we when we look at procurements and acquisitions in general is I, we know there are things that work and there are things that don't. And I really wish instead of solicitations asking for generic staffing plans that uh, that organizations, that procuring organizations, would really hone in on what they actually care about. So you know, is there a you know have they historically had a problem meeting some you know certification requirement that is hard coded into a cybersecurity policy. We encounter that one a lot where, you know, people who fill certain positions absolutely have to have certain certifications. Is that what's driving that? Or have, you know, does the incumbent contractor just have a history of not staffing correct? And so what, what's frustrating for me as a writer when I see these sections is it, there's, I know, I usually, unless, you know, it really was just, you know, lazy SOW writing, there's usually a reason why the government wants us to write up 10 page staffing plans. I don't always know why. And so I think if there's any, if there are any government buyers on the line, um, it would be really helpful before you just kind of slap in a request for a staffing approach to think about what historic challenges you've had or what changes you would like to see the contractor staffing and let me write a concrete plan to that. Because one of the reasons why this is so boilerplate is, is the request is usually pretty generic and open-ended, right? It'll be a throwaway line in the eval criteria or a, a throwaway line in SOW saying, you know, the, exactly what's here. How do you source, attract, recruit, onboard, and retain key staff, right? That's sort of begging for, it's a generic question that's begging for a generic mm -hmm. response. With just a little bit Absolutely. of extra thought, you know, focus in on what it is you actually care about on staffing, 
and let me come up with like a quantified discipline plan to do that, just like it would be for an SOW question. I, I, I agree with that. Oh. So Spence, something that you've said has um, kind of struck a chord for me too, because you have, you know, the staffing plan, which is this question up on the slide, and then you actually have your key personnel requirements, which are actually usually mentioned in the management approach, and staffing is usually just a subsection of that. So the two are actually more often than not separate. You will have, you know, your key personnel, you'll have your resumes where you have the requirements for those things like um, certifications that they have to have met. All of that will be separate from this. So I, I do think that's really interesting. And, and I agree. And I think, I think this goes around to the whole bigger issue, right, with GovCon and kind of coming back to these lies, damn lies thing on the slide is, you know, since I think you've said it before in conversations we've had, you know, the my least biggest thing, I think all of our biggest issue with government contracting engagements is that many engagements are effectively personnel um, servicing and staffing requirements as much as we all don't want to admit it, you know, FAR 37 be damned on this thing. Like there is, it is a staff augmentation whether we want to admit it or not. And a lot of these cells are written that way. Um, and you know, it, it is very much since what you were saying is the whole you, you ask for a generic response, you're gonna get a generic answer. And if the government's putting in, you know, little to no effort on actually thinking about what kind of workforce they want the contractor to fulfill in the actual metric, uh, how do you how do you not say that that's not just a butts and seat program, right? And, you know, I think a bigger conversation under this is um, what we're seeing, right, are these kind of recompetes with incumbents. And incumbent capture has a lot to do with this because I can write you a 25 page response on how I'm going to, you know, source efficiently, attract correctly, recruit effectively, onboard quickly, and retain with professional development to use all the button words and key buzzwords I can. Wow, beautiful um, adverb. Thank you. Um, but if um, this is a incumbent capture mainly project and we all know that, then what does my effort have to do with anything? Then shouldn't it just be on incumbent capture? And if the incumbents are working nine to five on site, I can't call them and I should not. You know, how realistic of a response do you think you're going to get? That's mainly so just I my venting point. <laughs> yeah, so I have a great, I have a great anecdote about that. But to me, it's kind of funny. So I wrote, it was a, for Project We Won. And um, I did, I wrote a, you know, pretty honest, I knew that they wanted to keep a lot of the incumbents. So I wrote for a pretty blunt, honest approach on incumbent capture. And, you know, in our uh, post-award debrief, um, they, you know, really ripped me to pieces for relying on incumbent capture. It was like, you know, great proposal, whatever, like you almost lost because incumbent capture. Now here are all the incumbents we want you to capture. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I don't understand why, why we had such a hard time being honest about that. Why, I mean, it's, it's, cause we, I, I, and there are other proposals I've lost where I've gotten burned for even mentioning it. And I don't, I don't understand why there's such hesitancy there. It's, you know, if, if you don't, right? if you don't it, you love the people on, yeah, it's just, it's kind of weird. I don't get it. And it really ruins, you know, so like, let's all think outside the box for a second, right? So say you're responding to one of these, you know, cloud things, or even, you know, some R and D technology, something that's kind of a, uh, a, you know, a niche effort, right? We're like actually being agile and rapid and being able to kind of, you know, work and iterative with the government um, comes into play. And so let's kind of put ourselves in that scenario. Um, say there is a non-traditional GovCon that actually has better systems, infrastructure, and experience in place, but they have no idea how to respond to a staffing section or do they know the players, but they have the better capability. But if everyone's out here and all your main competitors are signing LOCs or LOIs or you can't talk to them or you make them write this plan, you know, what happens um, if why don't we kind of approach it of having these, you know, kind of combine um, you have the best person and then let them go out and hire after they win or work with them to find the best person. I don't get why we ask for the whole kit and caboodle. Um, up front when we know that things are going to change and if we're going to be more agile about our requirements gathering and you know more stews instead of sows, why don't we look at staffing the same way? So it looks like Amber you know, one, one thing to keep in mind to too <laughs> when uh, when when contracting professionals sort of sit down to to write these things, you know what's what's interesting you're on the industry side, you're probably seeing 
10 to 15 solicitations of interest every month or two. And so these things become a lot it starts to feel like it's just the same thing over and over. If you're a contracting professional, 1102 in government, you might write two to three of these things in a year. And so I think the, the, what you sort of have to get as a, as a buyer writing these solicitations is, yes, of course, there's, there's concern that you have that you're going to bring a contractor on. You want to make sure they're able to staff it right away because, A, number one, you're probably weeks, months behind schedule. Number two, you're probably just sort of skating along as best as possible. And so it, it does matter to the, to the buyer and the agency to get the staff on. But I think what's, what, what I'm hearing from you all is, you know, there's perception and then there's reality. And, and we should cut through a little bit of, of the, the BS, frankly, and focus on really what matters and be, you know, be honest about things like incumbent capture. But I know we want to get onto this sort of second and even third point here the non-binding letters of intent and the commitment that I've written, written myself, you know, into solicitations before I really understood what was on the other side. Um, but w yeah, what are we, what are we thinking about these, these letters of intent and that commitment? How does that sort of operationalize on, on the private side? So intent, I letters mean, of intent versus commitment are, is really funny, right? Because anybody can intend to do anything. So letters of intent don't, don't hold any real weight, right? But it, it makes us all feel good. It gives us the warm and fuzzies. Oh, this person intends to work on this project. Letters of commitment, I feel like, have kind of started taking a nosedive because more and more contractors that I've seen that project people have had um, harder and harder times actually committing and, and signing them. Are people seeing the same thing? Yeah, so yeah. It, it, it keeps honest people honest. It's a good point. Um, and that's where I like it. Like it has zero legal value. It has zero operational value. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when the got, when you win and you show up first day and the government says, well, I know you bid this person is key and they signed a letter, but I really want you to keep this person. The letter it doesn't mean anything. Right. But I think it does, it does help to keep honest. You know, people don't like signing them if they know that they, they aren't actually going to support it. And I, and I actually just want to make that point about key personnel briefly too. So, you know, when we bid, like and it, it's tangentially related to letters of commitment. I mean, when I put together a key personnel team, you know, it, it's sort of like, yes, I mean, I, I'm doing my best good faith effort to put together a team that I think actually could show up on award. But I also know that it's really fake because I know that the government's not going to award on time. They're not going to, I mean, a letter of commitment saying that I'll start on May 1 when award is three months late. Like to me, that doesn't, I can't do anything with that, right? I mean, that, that person's doing something else. We didn't have them sitting around you know, waiting on award from the government. And so like it, letters, letters of intent and commitment to me, is like, sort of like the key personnel question writ large. When I bid a key personnel team, like I, I am at least mentally in my own head, committing them to the project, assuming mm -hmm. that it goes forward as planned. That falls apart as soon as award deadlines are missed and everything's three to six months late on award. Or when we show up and the government says, well, here's your key personnel plan, but I'm throwing it out the window because, you know, there's actually these five people I want you to hire instead. So it's ben, like, is, they, is they this how you're justifying your bait and switch? <laughs> I'm justifying bait and switch. I was, I was going <laughs> to jump in there about this is kind of how you, maybe you can avoid it. So on the government side, right, a way that you can protect your, your contractors coming in, right, that since you work closely with them. To me, that's the only thing LOI or an LOC can actually do because if you actually ask in your LOC or your LOI template of the GovCon that they have to specify how much that person is going to get paid, you know, all of those details. I've seen ones like that and those actually carry weight because all of a sudden you're protecting that because going back to the bait and switch, not saying fence does it, but I have seen countless, um, you know, defense and civilian government contractors basically get off the phone with someone signing an LOI that says, I want to get paid this much. They say, okay, sure. They go back to pricing and they're bidding in the dirt and that's not what's happening. And that's how you continue to lose because unfortunately it's a deadly cycle of, you know, unfortunately, LPTA, you know, maybe not for everyone on the phone, don't kill me here, but, you know, mm -hmm. about, that carries about 80% of the weight. And so they know they have to bid into ground and they'll say anything to get them to sign that LOI or LOC so they can submit a compliant response and get the win and then they'll figure it out later. And that's really realistically how the conversation is had. And, and, and my recommendation is, if you're a government buyer, if you're going to use LOIs and LOCs, actually think about the template you're putting out there and you can at least get yourself some protection to know 
that the key personnel that are being bid have at least had these conversations if they've signed a document stating, you know, their salary and their pay and their title and their benefits. Like, make sure that that's in there because if you get that level of detail, you at least know that Prime has done their due diligence in having this conversation. Hmm. It, it kind of reminds me of like uh, earnest money deposits in real estate. I, I'm selling a condo right now. I'll knock on what I hope I am. Uh, there's, there's an earnest money deposit, which is like a fraction of the total purchase price. And I don't even understand like, you know, it, it's just basically like a, a proffering, some sort of commitment, something that you have to do to like let the, the seller know that it's good faith. So like a, a, an LOI or a key personnel plan, yeah. Maybe we all understand tacitly that this doesn't guarantee really anything, but at least it's a, a gesture of effort that, you know, we, we can make in, in earnesty. So um, I want to move, yeah. sort of go on to the takeaways unless you guys have any, any final thoughts on, on these bullets. Just, so I think the pricing point is, is really smart. So, in fact, I'd like to see that more in price proposals. I mean, we should be having to disclose in price. If I can do a build up, if, I, if I'm presenting a price, it means I did a build up, which means I have salary data. So it's really trivial for me to openly disclose in my price proposal what salary basis I'm using to build up to pricing. And so I'd love to see more of that because mm -hmm. contractors lie about that all the time. I mean, they know somebody's gonna cost 150 K they, they bid them like they're gonna cost 75 K and they expect the government once they've got the government over a barrel to, to fudge it on the contract side and figure out a way to get that person, you know, paid more and get the contractor paid more. Um, but with, you know, on the, so, but Frank on, on the letters and intent and commitment side, you know, I don't, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I really like I, I like operationally, I can't be bound by that mm -hmm. when award is delayed, right? I mean, I just can't. Like, yeah. if I'm so here's how awards often work, right? So it's I'll, I'll, Friday, an award comes out, kick off on Monday, right? It's nine months. I submitted the proposal nine months ago. The original award was supposed to take sixty days. I like. I don't know. I, half those people haven't even worked for me anymore, you know, no matter what well, my retention yeah, rate right. I talked about was, you know, like it's I don't, funny though because I, or they they're on the project. That. Like the, the government expects you to have these people. They expect you to find other work for them. They expect you to incur the overhead costs and put them elsewhere. They like expect you to keep them busy. And I think that's really one of these, the big disconnects that we're talking about, right? We're saying we know on industry, like this isn't realistic. But does the government side actually get that? Yeah, and I Frank? and so we even if you, <laughs> yeah, no, I have a question for they don't. even when we no. even when we keep them busy, it's like I keep them busy and now they're on a project that's gonna take four months. So it's like, look, like I can make this person I said was gonna be available, I can make them available, but you have to wait six months until their current project wraps up because I put them on something else when you know we didn't hear from you for five months. Um, Absolutely. So it's, I, it's a ridiculous I, I, expectation. It, it is. And I don't feel, so I, I personally, I mean, letter intent commitment, like even as an employee, when I sign one saying I'm going to work a project, it like a year later, I, it doesn't, it just doesn't, it, there's nothing I can do with that. Like I'm on another project. You got to pay now. bills today, right? You know, it's impossible. It, yeah. This like, is why I'm an advocate of mandatory industry rotations for contracting professionals. I mean, I, I was in the government before I ever worked in the, in the private sector. And it's true. I thought my contracts, my solicitations, we're the center of the universe and the most important things in the world to myself and to the companies that wanted to get these. So no, I don't realize. LOL. I do not realize <laughs> how how far apart that is. Because and you know, but once the minute I left and went into the private sector and stayed in sort of federal federal con, you know con, consulting, it was selling back to the government. I, it didn't take me long to understand. Oh my gosh, there's so many other things we have to do. So many other contracts have to win. A lot of these things are, and you know, are crazy. And now I can literally write anything into a proposal that I want because it's all going to sort of fall out, um, you know, and get just get get, you know, established at the time of award. So yeah, there's there's well, a lot that that folks are ignorant about. But yeah, there's somebody wants <laughs> to make a point there, guys. Well, sorry, yep. just because you made that point, you know, that's also dangerous thinking, like we'll do it post award, you know, when we're doing contract negotiations, I can put anything yeah. in a proposal. It's not part of the contract. Amber and I actually, I, I believe, you know, we sat down with a GovCon lawyer recently for the post of GovCon and just posed the question, is your proposal mm -hmm. really a contract? And he went through kind of all these myths that we had heard as proposal people. So you'd be careful about that, Frank. That's true. I, that's a great, that's a great point. And I know Frank is eager to move on, but there's one more thing I want to say in that, because I, I love to compare 
I think the government does a lot of stuff right. So, but I still like to compare government and private sector. And the key personnel question is oh, something God. that I feel gets handled. I feel like it gets handled better on my large private sector contract. Because here's how it works, right? So a contract negotiation team will come to us and say, look, look we've accepted your proposal in principle. Now we're going to enter contract negotiation. That goes through. We, we do T's and C's. We get that out of the way. It takes two weeks, right? So then once that's good, it's like, okay, we've accepted your proposal. We've come to ter- agreement on terms of the contracts. Our anticipated kickoff date is a month from now. We need to know who's showing up on day one. Mm-hmm. I have a firm, that date is, is, it's binding. It's in a contract, like it's, it's gonna happen. Like it's gonna be May 1, everybody agrees to that. I have four weeks. I say, give me a week, I'll put together the final team. I present the final team, it's locked into the contract. It's good to go. I cleared everybody's schedules. We're ready to rock and roll. It's not a, you know, Friday, 5 p.m. Hey, you won, good job, 8 a.m. on Monday, let's get started. Um, so Spence, my only response to that is, my only response to that is, and then Frank, I promise you, we'll let you move on. Is <laughs> okay. Those people, those people that you're talking about on your commercial side contract, um, are probably getting paid t- two to three times more. They're not juggling about 25 to 30 different other contracts requirements. 200 people probably inundating their email and their voicemails a day to show them a one pager. And then, oh, by the way, you have your regular day job to do. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tough. Are out we really there. giving Amber the last word on this? I'm <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, you, two, you guys have two more sections to, to, to get it. So, all right. So, let's start right, our go. takeaways. When you're evaluating, um, you know, staffing, staffing plans and approaches, just think about. The de-emphasizing the identities and focus on the skills and the attributes that you want your key personnel to possess, because that gives the contractors a better idea of the type of profile that, that they need to staff and not necessarily that individual. And then when you're writing qualifications and staffing sort of labor categories, you got to be aware of, of writing, you know, uni- writing for unicorns. Basically, you can say what skills and abilities and certs that you want a, a person to have when they start work. But if that person, you know, if that's unrealistic or if it's like, you know, you can't get a PhD for an associate's price. So be careful when you're writing out I'm talking to the government folks out there. Be careful when you're writing them. It's great to get some input from industry or from some folks about how realistic your labor category descriptions are, because once you put those things out in the solicitation and they're in the wild, if they, if they don't exist, you're not going to get them no matter what. Um, All right, so our second section of this conversation is about market research. It's obviously something uh, very close to our hearts here at Public Spend Forum and GovShop. Um, Is market research free labor or is it government due diligence? Well, I think we can answer that question if we think about the real costs of the RFI process. We see a lot of RFIs come out and, uh, and I know we have some strong opinions on RFIs, so, folks on the panel, when the RFI comes out, what happens? What what actually goes on? And in, in is it is it easy? Because I think government buyers think like, oh, it's just an RFI. They're just going to write some answers. Maybe they spend an afternoon in the conference room. Bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. They send us the RFI. That's what happens, right? Oh my gosh, no, no. <laughs> If you want to see well, a bunch happen? of people in industry just get their wheels all spun up, put out an RFI, and then have their leadership tell them it's time to respond to it. People because lose their have, shit. They, they lose <laughs> their minds because it gets pulled out of, you know, the BNP, right? Your, your, your bid and proposal mm-hmm. cost. So that time and those resources are pulled out. They sit down. A solution. This is rarely, if ever, boilerplate information because it's not the same kind of spiel with the staffing approach and the management approach. A lot of RFIs are much more technically focused. They're actually asking for answers and suggestions. And that takes time. This is not a, oh, quick, just put out the RFI and uh, turn it around. Mm-hmm. If it's a good RFI, right? I think we're seeing, and you know, I'll give the government like a, a, a you know two thumbs up from what I've been seeing on the defense and civilian side. Um, RFIs recently, I think over the past year, I've noticed at least there they have been more of that asking for actual details, where it's an actual white paper, where they're you know they're they're admittedly saying, hey, we don't understand this. Can you explain this to us? And the questions, I I think I saw a. GSA RFI today where, you know, it was about some, some IT thing, right? But literally it was a bunch of, it was like a bunch of tables and they're like, hey, literally the RFI was like, does this even make sense? Does this look right? And 
Mm. That's a lot of work for someone to put in. And now I'll say I'm on the side of team RFI. Um, I love market research mainly because I think if you're in government contracting, your main source and your main source of passion and what you should be doing is serving the government and solving their problems. And I get we live in a capitalist society, but your passion should be about writing about these kinds of ideas and this should be fun and oh I my gosh that amber that's so hokey i can't even let you continue <laughs> it is that. hokey <laughs> it's true because if you if you believe what it's like that is what you should be doing if we all think about so why government you know federal procurement was made in the first place you know is for war and for bombs and so you should be trying to solve issues and that's where we are today but i think as an industry our creativity has been killed and gone because the government kind of puts out the same RFI over and over and over again. And I'm sorry, I don't want to tell you same contracting officer for the hundredth time responding to the same RFI over the past two years, uh, what my NAS codes are and what my GSA schedule you're, so is. So you're right. So, so a, a point that we should make before we move on is that there's obviously different levels of market research, right? Like there are the RFIs, mm -hmm. like I was talking about, that spin people up, that are actually solutions-based, that are suggestions-based. And then there are the ones that are like, what are your socioeconomic categories? Like, you know, the ones that are just trying to pull industry versus, you know, get actual information from industry. Exactly. I think, absolutely. So, so, my, so on my end, so I believe, firmly believe that if you take every RFI published in the history of the federal government, combine them together and read them backwards, it constitutes the word of saying that's what I think of the RFI. <laughs> so, I, wow. This, this, is that how you really do? There's, 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 there's a standing order in, in my company that we don't, we don't respond to. Um, and uh, total waste of time. Um, and the only, the only exception is if a trusted, valued customer asks us to because they're trying to valid, you know, they're trying to use responses to make an opinion. Or in the very rare instance, which, you know, I, I I love the vision, particularly that Amber's painting on uh, <laughs> uh, on, on RFIs, but I, I feel like it's maybe one percent where the government's actually interested in. Um, Absolutely, it's uh, like art, right? You ideas. only come across yeah. one one masterpiece <laughs> every once in a while, and I'll agree with that. And you know, kind of speaking to the federal, um, you know, the federal people on the phone. One um, industry very much believes, and this may not be true, that if an RFI is put out you already know who you want responses from. You already, like it's a waste of time because the people that are supposed to be shaping this have already started doing their job. And, you know, I think yeah. that's something Agreed. that's very hard to overcome in industry, even if it's not true. And then but, to so the my, government contractors on the phone. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 keep going. I was gonna say, even to the government contractors on, um, on the phone, that RFIs, you know, as much as Spence may hate them, and Lisa thinks it's hokey, um, RFIs can be used for a lot more than um, just writing a white paper and letting it live there. You need content for your freaking, um, you know, for your website, for your blog, because now everyone has one. Take your RFIs and turn them into a blog. You need an idea mm -hmm. for how do you get a hold of people that are buying your services. Oh, weird. There's a point of contact or two on this RFI if they're doing market research. They're buying your services. You want to know what you need a, uh, an opening for a warm call? You know, say, hey, I responded to this RFI two years ago, never heard anything about it. What happened? It's at least an opening for a phone call. So RFIs don't have to be a complete waste of time. You just have to be a little bit more creative on how you apply them. So I it's think so hard because does. it really is like a double edged sword, right? Because sometimes if you don't respond to an RFI, then the government thinks that there's not enough competition to compete it. So it's like if everybody sits one out, then nobody gets to play. Uh, but on mm -hmm. the other side, I've seen some companies put their hearts and their souls into RFIs and they've responded saying like, here's the solution, it's great. But you're not realizing that there's not an actual direct return on investment, like that money is not coming back. If there's no guarantee that that work is going to be competed and awarded. And not only that, but if you have a secret sauce and you've written down the recipe and sent it in an RFI, that secret sauce could become standard, right? That could mm -hmm. just be inserted right into the RFP and then all of a sudden you've given away your competitive edge. So it is and a double-edged sword. And, mm -hmm. But I also think I'm, I'm glad you brought up the competition side because part of my issue when we, you know, because it is, it's a major allocation of resources, which is why, I mean, I was, I'm being flipped, but I, I'm not. I mean, that's why we just don't respond to them, is that so much of it's contrived, right? So 
if you want, particularly if we're talking about fairly the average stuff the government buys. So most, most of my experience is in IT and cyber, but I'm sure this is true for other things too. If you want to justify setting it aside for HubZone, you can find enough hub mm-hmm. zones to compete. If you want to justify setting it aside for SDVUSD, you can do it. 8A, you can do it. I mean, it's so when most of the time when I talk to contracting officers issuing RFIs, it's simply to weigh the number of responses so they can figure out if there's a competitive pool. I, I can, if there's any federal buyers in the line, uh-huh. I can save you a whole ton of time and just tell you, yes, they're enough, right? <laughs> we have a proliferation of small businesses. That, that group exists. You may have to do a little bit of research to find them. You may have to structure, like you may have to actively you know, reach out and tell these folks that this procurement's coming so they're paying attention to it. But um, I mean, I, I don't feel like the figuring out competition is a valid reason for the government to put out RFI. It's a great opportunity not to for mention the plug the, right? the, the not the the only people that respond to the RFI does not constitute the entire marketplace. Like yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, enough yeah, to say, you know, so that just a note to the contract. Folks out there. You didn't get one from me, that's for sure. And this is why yeah. I really like just to, to, to plug GovShop shamelessly, right? Which I am not affiliated with GovShop, but I'll do Frank's job for him. So you know, mm. that's what's really cool about that is it's a, it's a really convenient way to quickly research a huge number of government contractors. So you don't have to get out on Google. I mean, you have this dedicated pool to determine co- competition. But you know, if RFIs didn't feel so contrived, I would have the rainbows and unicorns view that, that Amber has, which I didn't even know she was capable of. Um, so that's I'm good. not, I'm um, not. I think, it, I think it's just because I know it's not their fault, right? Like in order to do the paperwork uh, to get the, you know, to start the acquisition cycle, if I, if I understand kind of the life cycle processes, right, and the whole legal part behind, you know, putting in, you know, a need and a justification and those things, that information is required, you know, for that kind of paperwork. And from what I have heard from a lot of contracting officers is uh, these kind of RFIs and source of thoughts are very helpful for them to copy and paste into those, <laughs> into, those into those response sheets. And I'm it's sorry, if I'm be honest, that is what I've heard um, because they don't have enough time. And, you know, the, the, that, that's the best way because, like, a lot of these contracting offices are not SMEs in this part. That's why you're reaching out to the SMEs. And so for in order for them, you know, to me, I, you know, I think Lisa said it earlier, too, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I don't think the government can fully do their job, which is, you know, uh, you know po- especially contracting officers, which is getting the paperwork through the freaking process so we can all do something. Um, you know, if they do, they, but they need that answer, those answers and that content in order to fill out the paperwork and vice versa. As an industry, how can we expect to ask for better statements of works or requirement statements if we're not willing to put in the time to help the government oh. figure it out? Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll write an SOW for the government any day of the week. You guys just call me. I got you. I'll, call, I'll write a two. <laughs> I love those things. <laughs> well, we know, we know that there are, that you can issue draft solicitations and you can put out draft statements to work. I always think if, that, if that's what you're looking for out of an RFI, do that. Don't, don't ask for the basic demographic information that you can pull off. You know, I agree. Just write off GovShop. I agree with that. Um, I've, I know Spence has policy for, and I know Spence wants to sort of tell us a little bit about what happens when they do write an RFI, and I think that's worth, you know, hearing. But we had a question from um, our audience. Uh, uh, the question is, okay, so I think this is a, a contractor who's who's in a position right now. So the question is, we're considering responding to an RFI slash sources thought that was just published yesterday. The agency attached a super long draft statement of work with plenty of detail, but they're only asking for basic information like socioeconomic status and contract vehicles available. Uh, The Mm -hmm. the customer is right in our sweet spot, but we don't have experience with the specific agency. Are we wasting our time responding? Has another vendor already influenced the requirement? What would you guys tell us, this uh, attendee? They're looking to figure out if they need to put a set aside into this Mm -hmm. and where to put it. Yep. So and also you probably have sharing, the, the sharing the sharing yeah. the solicitation and the statement of work to give to sort of prime the pump for for industry a little bit too. Yeah, it depends so on what they're asking. I'll be honest. If the government doesn't really ask for comments, I mean, unless like if you're a big big boy that has more resources and has time to actually read over those things, if the government isn't directly asking for your input on the draft, I typically will skate right over that and answer whatever they're asking, or that's what I would advise the client to do. But those two questions. Um, they're trying to figure out if they need to do a set aside, 
and if anyone's going to throw a fit over there not being a set aside and then you know where to put it and so i would say that it hasn't you're past the shaping point of the style but you if you have a vehicle that this makes sense like not just a random vehicle but if you have a vehicle that makes sense for this to be competed on you know you should still respond and especially if you're a socioeconomic um you know vendor that can actually execute that work and you have a vehicle that makes sense i would you know in my opinion i would tell you to respond Mm -hmm. But don't get, don't get carried away. You don't need to write a giant response. I mean, I think, I think this if is a situation where, again, what they're asking for. Yeah. And, and this is, again, I mean, there's a lot. So there are, there are going to be some companies out there that, that don't have as much experience as, you know, as others. And they're going to get real spun up on this. And this is going to be their Memorial Day weekend. And there's going to yep. be time not spent with family. There's going to be time not unwinding. And look, I'm, this is, I'm kind of passionate about this it's an emotional roller coaster competing in this, in this market and people get really high on things like, Oh, this is it. This is going to be it. I'm going to make this account. This is going to make my year. I'm going to move on up. My family's going to have what they need. This is not untrue. And so I really want to implore government contracting professionals, the 1102s out there to consider that if all you need is socioeconomic data and the contract vehicles available, go and find that information, do your own research the responses you're going to get aren't going to constitute the entire marketplace anyhow. This is one of the reasons why we created GovShop. We wanted to put an end to bad RFIs and all this emotional volatility that occurs in our space. Um, so we got to, we got to move on. Um, yeah. So, so again, some takeaways here and I know on the, on that, what do they actually do with RFIs here? Do they actually do sometimes they, staff them down like in Spence, you know, sometimes you guys, you'll staff them down to junior associates as a training exercise, but sometimes interns. they'll do what I just described. Yeah. Interns. It's great intern work. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the mid-level manager who's trying to make, you know, make it, they are going to spend and they and their team are going to spend the holiday weekend doing this. So, you know, if that's what you want, you don't care about that and you have no soul, that's fine. But if you do care about that, keep that in mind. <laughs> um, okay. My, I'm off my soapbox. Uh, and we've got about we got about 17 minutes. So again, be mindful about the information you're requesting in an RFI. They take a lot of time and energy, a lot of bid and proposal costs. If you're using an RFI to support a set aside decision, you're doing it wrong. Uh, putting out a draft RFP and asking for people to, you know, dissect the, the 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 SOW, give you feedback on whether things are paused. That's the right way to do an RFI. Okay, our final topic: missed connections, best in class contracts. This is a bit of a fad. Um, what exactly are the merits of uh, best-in-class contracting? I know, especially the, the proposal scoring sheets. So this is going to be our last topic. So let's let's dig in here. Uh, who wants to take our our first sort of scrape at the the BIX? Hmm. I think Amber and Lisa love it. Should, so it they should go first. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna let you all I was gonna let you guys start. I was gonna sit back and watch where this unraveled, but I. Uh, I will, I'll make a definitive statement. Um, I will stand on my mountain that I will never be behind anything in the government um, that says, or policy regulations, whatever, that doesn't have any type of quantitative metrics against it. I'm sorry. I think the five freaking justifications for BICs are ridiculous. They are opinion, they are biased, they are based on personal opinion, and they are, there's no metrics or quantitative way of doing it. And before everyone gets going, all I want to do is point out, you know, today, you know, GSA actually posted um, an RFI on um, IT training when HCATS is their best in class vehicle. I opened the RFI, and this is a tie back to the last thing to look at the vehicle options they were weighing, and none of them were HCATS. So before Sun mm. tells everyone how much she loves scoring sheets, <laughs> all I'm going to say is that the RFI that was posted on IT70 SIN 132 is for training and GSA isn't even using their own best in class vehicle for it. Womp, I'm off my now. Womp. Golly. <laughs> Golly. Well, what's the beginning? How much do you like Bix? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell us something good. But, uh, Lisa, you're, you're, you kind of like the, the proposal scoring sheets or was it, am I wrong? No, you're super wrong. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very I'm much the one. I like them. And, oh yeah, that's and, 
happen. And I'll tell you why why I'm against them. It's I think it goes back to just, you know, how Amber and I were brought up again in proposals. A proposal is supposed to be a story, right? My least favorite red team comment is, mm, well, it doesn't tell a story. Because that's what everybody has said, <laughs> right? About proposals and about what it is. It's supposed to be a sales document. It's supposed to win you this work. So then the government said, okay, let's take the story element out of this and let's make a scoring sheet. Let's make it more objective because what does blue, green, yellow, and red actually mean? The problem with that is, as Amber said, the justification for what these new scoring pieces mean are still subjective. And so they've tried to make this proposals into a numbers game. And in some ways it can totally work and in others it's just flopped. And I know, Spence, you have some really specific examples of when it works and when it doesn't. So uh, just before I dive into that, on the high-level BIX, I think there's a lot of agreement among the panel. Um, and shoot me down if I'm, I'm speaking for everybody. But I don't like them either. And one of the things I really don't like about them is um, there's really two, two main reasons. So everyone that I've seen that's in my space is biased towards diversified contractors to the expense of niche players who actually are far better than the diversified organizations that deliver in specific services. So a great example is Alliant, right? Even under the new scoring category, you really have to be a diversified IT provider to score successfully on Alliant, with very few exceptions. And yet, really high-end cyber deals end up on Alliant. And it's frustrating because, you know, as a niche provider, for example, most of my projects are smaller in size, I'm spread between commercial and private sector, so I don't have the massive multi-award contracts that you know scored highly on there. And yet some of the work that I'm far better suited as a, as a niche player to execute against ends up on these diversified IT vehicles. And so I think that's, that's a mistake. I just think that, that's uh, the government letting itself down because you know it's locking out some of the specialized players. And kind of in the same vein, you know, doing business with the government is really, really hard. Um, and the BICs, Getting on a BIC and working with them once you're on them is pretty much the hardest type of government contracting. And so a lot of organizations just don't want to do business with the government. If you're an elite cybersecurity provider, the government, you want to be as far away from the government as possible from a procurement perspective, right? The private sector is a much juicier, much more target-rich environment for you to work on from a sales and marketing perspective. And so you, you stay away from the government. And, and the BICs yet encourages that yet again because it's another level of complexity that non-specialists have to deal with and so the government is missing out on the best cap most you know most capable best suited providers for a lot of their specialized challenges you know on the proposal scoring side what i really liked about it i, I won't i won't argue that it was perfect right so we're talking mainly about you know alliance and debts and oasis and you know, uh, you know recent solicitations that are structured around quantified scoring is that you know so much particularly with uh, idiq type contracts so much of approach language is pretty fluffy and meaningless. Um, Alliant is a great example. I mean, I bid on the you know two iterations ago, and I mean our approach meant nothing. Our team meant nothing. It took two years to award. The team had dissipated by the time of the award. Our approach was just I think we probably bought it from somebody off the shelf. Um, it didn't mean anything. And so the government was trying to evaluate a meaningless team and a meaningless approach. And at least with you know the latest iteration of Alliant, they tried to think through. You know, what are the types of organizations we want in this vehicle? How do we measure that? And then how do we come up with something that, you know, is really easy to respond to? I mean, it was, it was easy, you know, checklist. And then, sheet to then respond a to, Virginia, to and then a, a federal circuit court uh, smashed it down and said, redo this because you screwed up your scoring sheet. But but they didn't, right? It was sort of, it was sort of esoteric. It was more that it was almost like, because it revolved around how they evaluated DCA compliance, right? I mean, that was the crux of why they threw it out. Which to me is kind of ridiculous. It's like you're, that is that is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> I mean, and I, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. And I think Bix was a Bix was a weird band aid of us trying to make something um, harder than what it is. Because right, you know, Spence, I agree with you, right? It, it's very esoteric. It was uh, based on how someone defines DCA audit. Um, so then to me, you know, yeah, I think what Bix was trying to solve with these scoring sheets and I, I worked the year of the GWAC. I went from VET to, I went from HCAP to VET to, to CSP3, which was not, you know, which was a different kind of thing, but same kind of storing mechanism to 
um, Alliant full business and Alliant small business too. Um, so I, I lived that year. year and yeah, it was a, it was a horrible <laughs> year. <laughs> but the biggest thing I took away from that, you know, when you would think, especially as a proposal person, where that it would be easier is that you actually learn, you know, I think this is really what got Lisa and I into the pulse is how much um, humans are still behind the input of this contract information that's being asked. And so, you know, all of these things that are being asked where you have to highlight this or circle this, and yes, it's the contractual language, but you would be shocked on how much was missing. And I felt like I had to go back to the government on behalf of my clients more times than I ever had before in a proposal response and created more work for them again um, to continue trying to check these, these marks off. So to me, you know, BICs get right trying to, like, the, the, it's, it's getting there where it's trying to kind of break down and make it easier for contracting officers to evaluate proposals. Um, you know, and that's a whole different discussion on how to do that. But to me, what they miss off is, you know, anyone can buy those certs. Anyone can buy those past performance references if they have enough money. Um, so you might be getting a vendor that has all of these nice check marks, but can they actually execute? Or are they, you know, a venture capitalist firm or an investment people that came down and bought a bunch of small businesses, put them together, checked it off the marks, and now you have, you know, half of your vehicle are full of people that are looking to make money but don't understand how to support you. So to me, that's, that's just not a good story. Out. It's not a good story. <laughs> so what would you guys We tell like really to good stories. <laughs> what would you what would you guys have liked to have seen instead on those um on those vehicles? I I enjoyed Vix because truthfully what I told people that were going after it, I was like, listen, even if you lose, this is a great way to get your contract shop in order. <laughs> This is a great way to make sure that you have the paperwork you need. Like, you know, there's no such thing as like actual losing. Like it depends on how you look at it. But like this is a good way to make sure you have all the paperwork. And to me, I liked it because I was able to get our clients um, in order of, you know, their contractual shops and figuring out what they miss and what they don't miss. Um, but to me, you know, if I have to, the, one of the best experiences I have had working on the proposal was actually um, the CIOSB3 small business NITAC proposal. Um, there's storytelling and there's scoring with it. And yes, you still have to read it, but I think NITAC does a really great job of kind of outsourcing the needs and kind of the federal sales and some of the CETA work that comes with it. Um, so they can actually focus on gathering requirements, but you, you wrote a story, but they asked the right questions and very realistic questions. And there was also scoring behind that. So to me, that was my best experience I've had with these semi-quasi kind of big proposals. Yeah, you know, and I, and I like what you're saying there, where it's kind of the hybrid, and I think that we do need a sort of hybrid awarding in our procurement, right? Like that's, because it can't just be all or nothing. And I just keep being reminded of one story that I heard about people that went to fill out the form for HCAT, and it was the government form that they had put out, and there was two options, two different tracks based on whether you were a small business or a large business. The only difference was that it said small or large in the header. The small business filled out the large business one and was thrown out immediately because they filled out the wrong form. And yes, obviously we need to check the boxes in order to get down selected in these, you know, acquisition life cycles, but it, you can't, it can't be all or nothing like that. It can't literally just be check the box. Like we're all people. Just people that are good with this paperwork. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. This is this is a huge this is the human element of GovCon, right? This is what Amber was talking about before, where even if a project isn't a staffing project, it is because it's people performing the functions that you've set aside in the scope of work. So that's all I would say is that we, we have to keep that human element in it. And if we start scoring it, it just, you know, what's the difference between us and the robots? And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was always taught as a as when I was coming up as a contracting professional, you know before there was Uber and smartphones, I'm dating myself very poorly. But when I was coming up, it was, you know, it was no scoring sheets were not in favor because we wanted to have the ability to make subjective based on what we read at a proposal, based on, you know, how confident, you know, a proposal made us in the solution. We wanted to have the ability to yeah. say this one's green and this one's blue. Um, you know, the, the mathematics make that a lot more difficult and, frankly, utterly more protestable because I, you know, if you read the FAR, 
you'll know you, you really can't protest the discretion of a contracting officer um, or their judgment. Um, right, but it's, it's a big Lebowski, that's just like your opinion, yeah. man. <laughs> exactly, great point. <laughs> So do you guys our takeaways think, on, on this, unless there's, yeah, go ahead, Spence, please. Well, quick, just another question. So do you guys think that the um, fix have brought any value? Because the alternative, right, is to sort of ditch the, you know, really try to move away from GUACs in general. Um, I mean, do you guys, do you think that it's been worth it for the government in the end? No. No, yeah, and no. I'll tell you, no, I mean, because BICs, right, are a, what I do think the government is starting or trying to get moving is category management, right? And BICS is one way of, you know, kind of that spider that they think that they can get in managing it. But where I think they're going and with the latest memos that have been put out is I think they've also realized how rigid they've made it and how much power, I mean, I'm sorry if there's GSA people on here, how much power they've given GSA over everyone's contracting requirements. Um, and so where I think they're going and where I think BICS has kind of, we needed something to kind of start the conversation, right? And there's only, you know, I think what kind of started this whole conversation between all four of us before, you know, any of the participants were involved was about orals and, um, you know, how come that's kind of, you know, who's using that and what's the benefit of that? And I think this fix has kind of started in another conversation of how can we actually streamline this buying? And so category management, I think, is going the way of every agency is going to be their own SME in a different way. And then, then I think each agency, will have its own bit again. So it's kind of like the pendulum is going to swing right back to it. The only question really being is who presides over those bits. And I think it's an irresponsible thing to say that, you know, GSA should be handling all of that when they have their own stuff they should be getting. So I think that's the only warning we should all heed is who's going to actually oversee these. But I think BICs have done a great job of starting that conversation and getting, you know, categorized procurement going. Um, because we, ha you know, in my opinion, I think that's where we have to go. It makes the most sense, you know, but also understanding that we're dealing with the human element here in government contracting. I, I think it's going to be Brand the Broken who's going to be presiding over the BIC, if I'm, if I'm not God. mistaken. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry, I had to work that one in there. Sorry, spoiler. Um, okay, so that's, that. we're definitely at the top of it. This has been a lively discussion. I think we're going to have to do it again um and and just keep sort of our 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 fingers on the pulse so to speak of what's going on because at the very least i think it's important for buyers in the public sector to hear you know the perspectives of some you know govcon gurus practitioners people that advise and write proposals like what's happening on the other end you know maybe it would be fun to get a couple of uh, public sector contracting professionals to come on and do the same thing um gosh what are we reading when we see these proposals you know uh, what do capability statements really mean? That kind of thing. So if we've got any buyers on the line that are interested in sort of doing a, a corollary or a mirror version of this, reach out. We'd love to have you. Um, and, uh, and and Lisa, Spence, and Amber, thank you um, for sharing your perspective so candidly and uh, with such energy. This is this has been terrific. Um, I'm going to close it out, but I, are there any final thoughts uh, in, in, a, in a brief minute before we, we do that? I know what Tammy Davis out there thinks, and this is uh, our other commenter said the same thing. Basically, it's been one of the most authentic discussions on key aspects of government contracting. She appreciates it. Uh, we will try to have more in the future um, because I've had fun, and uh, it also gives us a chance to promote GovShop, which, like we like we said a couple times, is a, a sort of a one-stop shop for government contracting. It is free to use. GovShop.com. When we mail these slides out, or you can do it right now, go to GovShop.com right now, and you can search right away in GovShop. Um, we've got, oops, uh-oh, I hit the hot link. All right, sorry. Um, now it's taking me out of my presentation, but that's okay. We've got some great learning videos. You can go to uh, watch our our, um, our tutorials on GovShop. Um, you know, those are all on YouTube to help you learn sort of what you're doing and, and how to use it, but it's super easy. Um, I want to tell you also about uh, some products that Pulse has, uh, namely their playbook. Uh, Amber, Lisa, why don't you tell us real quick about the Pipeline playbook and why uh, our audience should uh, should buy this? Sure thing. Uh, the Pipeline playbook is something we put out every two weeks, uh, approximately, and it's kind of like a 10,000 foot snapshot of what's happening in industry. Uh, we like to look at all the comment, uh, contracts that we're seeing that are being impactful 
to industry and the government, uh, and we do our own little analysis on them. So in this one that we just put out today, we have 77 upcoming events, 65 past events, 13 pre-solicitation bids, 10 active bids, and 17 awarded bids. Terrific. And if you do want to, to buy that, we've got uh, at least a number have been kind enough to give um, Public Spend Form and GovShop uh, our own code uh, for a discount. You can get 10% off any Pulse product if you use GovShop 2020 at checkout. So definitely go check that out. Um, is it the Pulse of, Pulse of GovCon or Pulse of Government Contracting? What's your URL? It's the PulseofGovCon.com. The Pulse of GovCon Not up. It's just Pulse, we'll, Pulse GovCon. Oh, sorry. PulseGovCon.com. <laughs> yeah. We'll put it in our. Uh, we know what our website is, don't we? For sure. Um, and you can find it too. Some. Uh, we'll have it all over the place. All right. Well, listen. Um, thank you all so much, and thank you all in our audience for um, for spending the hour with us. Hopefully, it was valuable. I know I found it to be valuable. Lisa Spence and Amber, thank you for your time. Um, let's do it again soon. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Bye-bye now. Have a great day, everyone.